This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. And I tell you what, God can make you a better father today. All right, you can't go back and do nothing about what you did in the past. It's gone. It, it's gone. But if you'll accept who God told you to accept, and what he told you to accept about yourself, and if your children will let go of it too, because the problem is also with the kids. They hold on to the past. It robs the future of a better father. And then the father holds on to the past, and it robs him of his future. And there is no future for the relationship because the past, like a robber, stole the future. Glory be to God. Christmas is near, and we invite you to join us for our special Christmas Day service, Saturday, December 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make plans now to join us on December 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in through the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app, YouTube, Facebook, and if you're in the Atlanta area, join us in person. Set your reminder today. We can't wait to celebrate with you. This is your world, so let's vow to make it a better place. Let every heart that needs to know your love is here to stay. Ooh, it's time we live a new life. Let us love shine bright in you. We're saved by His grace, so we embrace your love today. If you have your Bibles this morning, go with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and verse 12. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation, Exodus chapter 20, and verse 12. Uh, I thought about showing a lot of pictures of fathers, perfect fathers. I was going to put perfect fathers on the screen until I ran into a dilemma, there are none. And so there's nobody on the screen. And neither did I want to come in and just preach a symbolic fatherhood message. I really wanted to dig into this. And as I told you, this grace-based marriage ser series has been a series of me reevaluating my thoughts and the things uh, in my life and the, the shortcomings in my life to be able to teach and to show you that I know where the finish line is. Well, today I wanted to apply the same thing to fatherhood. And uh, every father in here, I want you to listen very carefully. This is your day of deliverance. Every father that's online, I want you to listen. This is your day of deliverance. Today, I want to, I call this sermon, Overcoming the Regret of Fatherhood Failures. Overcoming the Regret of Fatherhood Failures. And I wanted to start off in Exodus 20 and 12. He says in verse 12, honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So even under the law, there is associated with honor in your father and mother uh, long life. So long life is promised when you honor your father and, and mother. And so let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 and 1 and move under the grace of God where you see the Apostle Paul repeating this moral law. And in verse 1, he says, children, we're going to read one through three, children, obey your parents in the Lord. So now he's not only just talking about, you know, your natural parents, but he's not talking about your spiritual parents as well. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. He says, this is right. This is right. Honor your father and mother. He says, it was the first commandment with a promise. Honor your father and mother, he says, and I've got a promise attached to this. And then verse 3 says, that it may be well with thee, 
and thou mayest live long on the earth. So here he clarifies it more. He said, even though we're not under the law, but we're under grace, it's still good for you to honor your mother and father uh, because there's still the promise that carries over. See, the difference is under the law, you, you had to try to achieve this through rule keeping, but under the grace of God, the Holy Spirit is the administrator of this law, and so the Holy Spirit is going to be available to help you do this. It's going to be available to help you to walk in this kind of honor. And he says, when you walk in the honor, when you honor your parents, he says, it will be well with you and you will live long on the earth. Well, I asked, well, what if that doesn't happen? Because we're living in the most dishonorable season that's ever been on the planet. Well, the opposite is true as well. Those blessings will, the, the consequences is not walking in those blessings. Now, I looked at that, and I know you think right now maybe we're going to talk about the kids, but I wanted to do this as a setup because throughout the Bible, there were parents that were going through stuff. Eli, who had uh, these two sons that were committing sexual fornication with the women at the temple, and they completely disregarded the rules of the temple. And God came to Eli, and he says, your whole family will die early. And then David, who had Absalom, and don't, I mean, don't, don't you know that, that hurt that, that Eli's heart? That, those are his kids. And then David, with Absalom, uh, Absalom killed his brother because he raped his sister. And, um, you know, he knew he was a good-looking kid, and he had this long hair, but he rose up against his father and dishonored his father, and one day riding the horse, all of that hair got caught in the limbs of a tree, and he couldn't get down. He couldn't untangle himself. And as he was hanging there, they just came and they threw a spear in him and killed him. Of course, you know that broke David's heart. And then you have Noah, who you're familiar with. Noah was working at a, been a very hot day that day, and he was drinking wine instead of water and, and messed up and had a little bit too much wine. And so it was hot. And, and had the wine, so Moses went in, the, I mean, uh, Noah went in his tent, took all his clothes off. Can you imagine? I'm, I'm drunk, I'm hot. And Ham came in and saw it and went and exposed his father. But his other two sons came in backwards with a robe. And the Bible says when Noah found out what Ham did, he, uh, he, he cursed him. And, and the curse went from that point all the way throughout the generations of Ham. I, I'm trying to show you that God takes this thing very seriously, but then I want to deal with what he now warns the parent with. You see the warning of the children, but now what is he saying to, to the fathers and to the parents? Well, look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 20 through 21, in the King James first and then in the Amplified. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20 through 21, in the King James and the Amplified. And and pray for me, I don't, I don't want miss to miss out on the revelation God showed me trying to rush through it, so I'm not here today to try to get through the message because there's just a lot of neat things that are going to happen here today. Verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in, in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto God. So you can see God's attitude about that. But then look at this. He said, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Uh, at least they'd be discouraged. Look at this same verse of Scripture in the Amplified Bible. He says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke or irritate or fret your children. Do not be hard on them or harass them, lest they become discouraged and sullen and, and morose and feel inferior and feel frustrated. So while there is a warning and information given to children about how to honor their father, there's also specific information given to fathers, wait a minute, don't break their spirit, one translation says. Don't, don't frustrate them, one translation says. And what happens a lot of us as fathers, we have done just that. At somehow, sometime in our life in raising our kids, uh, again, out of ignorance, we've done that. But I want to I share some things with you because it's not good for you 
to open yourself up to the voice of shame and condemnation because now Satan wants to use all of that. Listen to me carefully. I don't know any father who doesn't feel like they have failed on some or even on numerous occasions. This feeling of failure can be, can, 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 if you allow it, this feeling of failure can fall out of control and it can uh, prevent you from being the leader God wants you to be in the home if you allow the feelings of failure to dominate you. Feelings of inadequacy will sometimes cause you to engage in something I call self-shame. Feeling like I'm just inadequate to be the father or maybe I should have never did it or I just, I'm just not a good one. Those feelings of inadequacy will move you into self-shame. Now listen to me carefully. This is a trick of the devil and he's tricked a lot of fathers. So the feelings of inadequacy trying to move you to engage in self-shame. And the Bible says, he that believeth in God shall not be, shall not, him, he that believeth in Jesus shall not be put to shame. And so what happens is it tries to engage you into self-shame to reinforce your initial failure. So it's all about keeping you in that spot of failure. I'm a failure. I'm a failure. Now, while this shaming cycle may appear to help, and some people are thinking, well, how can it appear to help? Well, you feel like, well, you know, somehow you're like going to be better by just falling in this shaming cycle and it appears to help, it only, it, it's, it's only another manifestation. What the shaming cycle does, it's, it, it, it will manifest indirect pride. Follow me carefully. Indirect pride. How would I describe indirect pride? Well, indirect pride will say something like, I'm no good, I'm a complete failure. You can say that. And by the way, that's pride. By the way, that's pride. If you walk around and continue to say, I'm no good as a father, I'm a complete failure, you have become a victim of indirect pride. Rather than I'm a redeemed man and I'm a father who has simply made another mistake. So you got a choice. You can let the shame cycle move you into indirect pride and if that shame moves you into indirect pride, then eventually you're going to stick with the, the shame instead of with what God says you are. And, and this is going to have to be done by faith. And when I thought about it, I'm like, oh my goodness, that was pride. I thought somehow that was a way to humble myself. Look at the scripture with me in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 5 through 8. We're going to look at the voice of shame versus the voice of God. And you've got to ask yourself a question, are you spending more time recognizing and submitting to the voice of shame while you are not recognizing and submitting to the voice of God? Because pride is all about you bowing the knee to your way. Pride is all about you bowing the knee to your way. It is a person who will not submit to what God said about a thing. That's pride. It's the individual who, you know, God says to do this, and you say, no, I'm going to do that because I feel this way. And I'm saying regardless of how you feel, don't allow pride to come in indirectly and stop you from bowing the knee to what God said about you. You simply have to begin to look at all of the failures and mistakes in your life as a father, and you've got to see it the way God said. You are a redeemed man, a redeemed father who has simply made another mistake. But now look at what he says here in verse 5, and I'll read verse 5 through 8. Likewise, you younger, submit yourself unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another. And then watch this. He said, be clothed with humility. A humble man is a man that will bow the knee and will submit to what God said about him. And remember, all of this is an attack against your identity. You are the righteousness of God. You have been redeemed. But Satan wants to attack your identity and say, you cannot be righteous. You cannot be redeemed. Look at what kind of father you are. Look at the failure that you've had in your life as a father. 
All right, now if you look at that, then now you're prideful. You're refusing to submit to and refusing to be clothed with humility. The Bible says be clothed with humility. Be a, be a man that will be ready to submit to what God had to say about it. I don't care how hard it is, be willing to submit to what God had to say about it. I'll show you in a moment. But here is Paul who uh, absolutely, you know, gave the church trouble had a lot of people killed in the church and stood by and watched the stoning of Stephen as he gave his permission to go ahead and kill Stephen. Now, now he gets born again and he sees, he sees Jesus on the road to Damascus and he has a memory. All of this stuff didn't go away. He had a memory of everything that he did. And I can't imagine what it was like for him now to be a born-again man and having, to, having the memory of everything he did, everybody that got killed, all the families that were separated because of him. Huh. And yet he showed up in, in 2 Corinthians, I'll show you in a moment, and said, I have wronged no man, I've defrauded no man, I've corrupted no man. How can you say that? i tell you how you can say that, because he says, I will humble myself and submit to what God said about me and not by the lie and the shame of all the things that really were. All right, now, watch this. He says, for God resists the proud. So you need God's help, but how can he help somebody who's operating in pride? How can, how, t think about it. How can God help a, a man who's operating in pride and won't submit to what God had to say about the thing, and, and as a result of you not submitting to what God had to say about the thing, you're operating with pride, and God says he resists the proud. You're still going around saying, I'm a failure. I'm no good. I don't know, somehow you think that some, you're going to get somebody's pity or something like that. But God says, I, I resist the proud, but I'll give grace to the humble. And God is saying to every man, if you will accept what God has said about you, and you'll accept his redemption and accept, accept his forgiveness, then grace will be there to repair you and everybody else that was damaged. But it can't do that when you're operating in this indirect pride. Go to the next verse, in verse 6, it says, Now humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Why? So he can exalt you in due time. You're going to have to come away from the shame, from the condemnation, even the guilt. You're going to have to come away from the feelings of failure. You're going to have to come away from naming yourself a failure because of what you did and, 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 and accept who God made you and believe that and humble yourself to that. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. God will exalt you. He'll exalt you out of that place of failure. He'll exalt you out of that place of shame. He will exalt you out of that place of condemnation if you'll concede and commit and bow the knee to what he has to say about you. Next verse. He says, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. That's awesome because he says, if you're going to humble yourself before me, cast your care upon me. You know what he's saying? If you don't cast your care upon him, you're in pride. God says, cast your care upon me because I care for you. And you say, no, I'm going to worry. I'm going to carry the care. You're in pride. I know it may seem like, you know, like you're an awesome person for caring the care, but he's like, in the same context, when he's talking about humility, he is saying, cast your care upon me. That's humility. But there's so many people that says, no, I'm going to keep my care. I feel like I need to hurt a little bit more. I feel like, I, no, 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 cast your care upon him because he cares for you. Praise God. And that means for every father in here, every care that you carry, every regret that you have, every, every, every sense of shame and failure that you've carried, in some cases for years, and I know men who have died with that, with that shame because they could never cast it. And it's hard for men to talk about their failures, especially to their children. And they've died with that because they, they took pride keeping it versus casting it. And look what he said in verse 8. This is so awesome. He says, so be sober. When you're humble, you're sober. When you're in pride, you're drunk. You're intoxicated. You're intoxicated. You see that? See, Satan wants to keep every man intoxicated. You're intoxicated when you're in pride. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. And you know who he can devour? A prideful man. He can devour a man who refuses to bow the knee to what God said about him. 
He can devour a man who walks around for the next 10, 10 years of his life, and, and he says, you know, I'm a failure, I'm no good. A man who's operating in that shame cycle, Satan can show up and devour you. But he says, if you'll humble yourself under my mighty hands, I'll provide grace, and that grace will set you free from your past. You know, the Lord said to me this past week, he said, tell the people, don't let your past uh, rob you, rob your future. He said it like that. I got to say, don't let your past rob your future. And I said, don't you mean rob me of my future? He says, no, rob your future. Because if you remain in your past, your future has been robbed from you. The good things that God has prepared for you has been robbed from you. And I tell you what, God can make you a better father today. All right, you can't go back and do nothing about what you did in the past. It's gone. It's gone. But if you'll accept who God told you to accept, and what he told you to accept about yourself, and if your children will let go of it too, because the problem is also with the kids. They hold on to the past. It robs the future of a better father. And then the father holds on to the past, and it robs him of his future. And there is no future for the relationship because the past, like a robber, stole the future. Glory be to God. Are you listening to me? Look at this in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 2 and 3. And the question is, are you more committed to the voice of shame versus the voice of God? I'm more committed to the voice of God, not the voice of shame. I've danced that dance long enough, over. I am not committed to the voice of shame. I'm committed to the voice of God. I got to. I got to. I would love to go back and redo everything that I did wrong, but I can't. That's impossible. You got to go forward. Even when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he took on all of the sins of the world and began to sweat blood, he did not allow that heaviness and that burden to keep him in that place. The Bible says he moved forward just a little bit. Every man in here, you got to move forward just a little bit. You got to go. You got to go forward. Enough's enough. Enough's enough. You've whined and you've hidden. You know, I know men who, you, you know the pain of dying with regret? God doesn't want you to die with regret. The pain of dying with regret wishing you had a chance to do this, wishing you had a chance to do that. That's not, that's not the will of God for your life. Today's got to be the day where you let it go. You got to let it go, and you're going to have to trust God and just be there, and be there the better man than you were that, that other time. And every time the devil shows up and says, you're a failure, you say, no, I'm not. I'm the redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. You're a failure. No, I'm not. I'm the righteousness of God. You, you're a failure. Oh, you're trying to take me back to my past, but I have left that place. I don't live there no more. Everybody got a past, but you don't have to live there no more. I don't live there no more, and I'm not going to let you cause me to move back in my shack when God has delivered me into a mansion. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 7 and 2 says, and Paul is talking here, and at first I thought Paul was lying because I read about all the stuff that Paul did. Paul said, receive us. We have wronged no man. Stop. Paul, what you talking about? Well, I just read it right over here, like right over here, like right next door to the left. Well, have you was wronging people. He said, I've wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. How in the world can you say that? When you submit yourself and humble yourself to what God said about you. That's what you say, because the devil wants you to open your mouth up and rehearse. I'm a failure. I'm no good. Well, baby, you know, I love you, baby, but yeah, I'm, I'm just ain't no good. I just, I got just, guess, I just guess you just, you know, you just got a bad daddy. And I'm, no, 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 no. I've wronged no man. I've corrupted no man. I've defrauded no man. Verse 3, I speak not this to condemn you. Paul was like saying, I'm not saying this to make those of you who are still in the shame cycle feel bad. He says, I'm saying this because I'm going to humble myself before God. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. 
old-fashioned notions of what's right for a wife and what's right for a husband don't necessarily stand up to God's Word. Creflo Dollar uncovers what the Bible says about equality in the marriage relationship in his four-message series, Grace-Based Relationships, Volume 3, The Equality of Marriage. If you interpret these scriptures from a worldly base, what you'll have here is a man thinking that he has the right to rule over and dominate a woman and for a woman to feel like submission is just about oppression. Those who are in Christ, they're heirs together. We stand on equal ground together because of what Jesus did. So if you're gonna talk about biblical submission, you must first conclude that it is mutual submission. The whole series can change your marriage today for a love gift of 25 US dollars or more, plus shipping and handling. Go to creflodollarministries.org and click eStore or call the number on your screen to claim your copy today. Join us online as we give thanks for all that God has done. Don't miss our special Thanksgiving Day service, Thursday, November 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, streaming worldwide. Thank God you got up this morning. Thank God you can walk. Thank God you can see. Thank God you've got food to fix. Maybe you don't have a gigantic turkey and all the trimmings and stuff like that. Don't get off with that. Thank God for the eggs, boiled, fried, scrambled. You can have them three different ways. Be thankful and give thanks. God's grace has kept us, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to give thanks. When we receive Jesus into our life, it becomes a new day. No more captivity and addictions and yokes. That's the day when the favors of God began to abound on our behalf. Tune in through the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app, YouTube, Facebook, or if you're in the Atlanta area, join us in person. We can't wait to celebrate with you. We must respond to the spiritual laws of God. A proven principle Taff and I have operated in for many, many years is the law of sowing and reaping. Now, when you sow into this ministry, you are sowing into good ground. Why? You see, your seed is not wasted. In fact, your seed is a twice sown seed, meaning that it'll work in different places at the same time. Your financial seed goes toward helping hurting people, both globally and within our local communities. We thank God for your support. You may support Creflo Dollar Ministries outreach missions by calling us or visiting our website. You enrich lives in ways you can't begin to imagine. God bless you. Join us online as we bring you praise and worship from the World Changers Church family and the Word of God from Pastors Creflo Dollar and Taffy Dollar. For more information, visit us at CreflodollarMinistries.org. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe.